few years ago, I gave a talk at a conference that has come to be referred to as my moderation talk. And I think it's because of that that I have definitely not been invited back. The thing is, I wasn't advocating moderation. I was acknowledging, or trying to acknowledge, that those of us who have struggled with our weight our entire lives should be very careful about holding ourselves to a standard of absolute perfect dietary adherence, or we are very likely setting ourselves up for massive self-sabotage when, not if, when, we temporarily fall short of those standards. I was advocating reality, and advocating reality strikes me as extra important to do in the plant-based world because the culture around perfectionism and frankly restriction is so intense. And I have seen it put so many women, myself included, into a complete self-loathing spiral, sometimes for years. It seems to me that there is even more judgment and shame in the plant-based world around not doing things perfectly and being compliant than there is in the other neighborhoods of diet culture. And that's really saying something because diet culture in general is a toxic cesspool of judgment and shame. But I continue to be amazed at how it plays out in this little corner of the world, this plant-based world where the facade is very much more tolerant and inclusive. It definitely seems like a kinder and gentler approach over here. The messages here in the plant-based world are things like, you don't have to weigh and measure your food. You don't have to count calories. Counting calories is an archaic tool of the past. You can eat as much as you want and never feel hungry. It's not your fault that this happened. It's not your fault that you gained weight or that you've had trouble losing it. And here's a very easy path out of it. And those things all have a grain of truth to some degree. But what they also do is they create a certain cast of superiority around the entire topic. There's a feeling about it and it's a very tantalizing feeling and a, a very tantalizing promise, especially when it comes on top of the already exciting promise of dramatic weight loss. And it goes something like, if you do this right, if you really do this right, you will not only achieve the goal that has eluded you all of this time, but you will also be better and smarter than everyone else. You'll be one of the rare ones who has broken out of the trap that has entangled all of those lesser humans who can't hack it. It's very exciting and very attractive to feel like not only can I accomplish this competitive goal that feels so important and that has been so difficult to achieve, but I will, on top of that, feel better than everyone else. But of course, there's a catch. Because if you don't do it perfectly, if you slip, or God forbid, if you backtrack and regain weight, then there's also a very clear implication behind that. And that's that, oh, well, I guess you're not special. You're one of them. You're one of the masses. No golden ticket for you. You're just not good enough to attain this prize. Throughout my life, whenever I have gained weight, it is a tremendous red flag that tells me that something in my life is very wrong. Not just something with my food, but something in my life. It's telling me very clearly that I am in trouble. I've probably been in trouble for a while. I need to make changes. I've probably needed to make them for a while. And clearly I'm not willing to make those changes for some reason. And so this is our only course of action. I realized fairly recently that the driving core impulse behind my drinking in my alcoholic days was a profound longing for attachment, for connection. From my first sip, drinking allowed me to feel closer to others, to move closer to other people, to drop my defenses that were always otherwise up. That is why the disinhibition felt so good. I could drop those walls, I could let people in, I could let them close, and there was no way to do that without the alcohol. It was amazingly clarifying for me to finally understand it in that way. Drinking wasn't about feeling cooler or funnier or sexier or any of those secondary characteristics. It was just about wanting to come in from the cold. As Adam Sud said in our recent conversation about addiction, drinking felt to me from the very first moment like a warm hug from the universe. Compulsive overeating, on the other hand, it's about many things for me, but it's not about that longing for connection. It's actually the opposite. 
It's a longing to escape connection to something or to someone that feels unsafe. It tells me that I'm living a life that, again, in Adam's words, does not feel safe, secure, hopeful, and exciting. It tells me that my life feels unsafe and therefore I want to detach, disconnect. It tells me that my attachments are problematic and the objective truth of the safety of those attachments matters a lot less than my subjective triggered interpretation of how safe they are. And this goes back to last week's discussion about driving on the wrong side of the road. If I'm driving on the left side of the road in London, objectively, I'm a lot safer than I would be if I were driving on the right side of the road. But it certainly doesn't feel very safe, and I'm probably going to be completely overwhelmed by an extremely strong desire to pull the car over and opt out of the entire process. So even though I am more safe than I would be doing the habitual, comfortable thing, I feel very unsafe. In both cases, drinking and compulsive overeating, what I need is the same. I don't need to attach to whoever's sitting next to me at the bar when I'm drunk and I feel like I have a new best friend. And I also don't need to detach and withdraw. I need self-expression. I need truth and full emotional presence. I need good, healthy connections and support. And most of all, I need practice learning how to stay with myself when I desperately want to leave, learning how to stay in my body, learning to stay present and attentive to whatever is happening. And also, inevitably, that means learning to stay uncomfortable. That is not easy. Eating is easy. When we look at someone who has gained weight or who struggles to lose it, we can feel so much judgment of that person for being a failure And the plant-based paradigm gives us really unique cover and justification for that judgment. Why can't they just eat more potatoes and less junk food? It's just the food. It isn't that hard. They must just not be that conscientious. When you're in a somewhat public position like I am, you don't just feel those projections from other people. You hear them. People feel entitled and compelled to share them with you. You get emails. You read them in comments. And the shame of that is off the charts. I am totally in awe of anyone, especially women, who can keep themselves productive and in the public eye through weight fluctuations. That is some warrior goddess shit. And that doesn't just apply to people with a public presence. It applies to everyone. This is anyone with any kind of life at all. People with a job to go to, with old friends to meet up with, Anyone who has any kinds of interests or passions or desires to basically explore anything at all in the world, to go on a vacation, to take the bus downtown, because the shame wants you dead or effectively dead. It wants you to stay in one small room for the rest of your life and not inflict yourself or your thoughts or your interests or your needs on anyone or on anything else. It tells you that you are more of a burden than others can possibly be made to bear. The shame isolates you completely. You withdraw. You feel just totally unacceptable. And most terribly and ironically of all, in that toxic shame soup, you impose upon yourself exactly the opposite of what it is that you actually really need. You wind up honoring the fear and making yourself feel safe in the only way you can, instead of seeking healing connection and support in a present and honest way with other humans. When it comes to issues around food and weight, we respond to ourselves when we are in terrible pain by saying, you're such an idiot and a failure for being in pain. What you need is to be in more pain. You need to punish yourself more sharply. You need to restrict your food more harshly. You need to comprehend that you're even more defective than you already think you are. And then maybe if you can succeed at that, and we'll be able to tell if you succeed because you lose weight, maybe you can be provisionally allowed to live in the world, but only then. Can we see how awful and counterproductive that is? And can we also see how ultimately disempowering it is as we surrender the assessment of our intrinsic value as a human over to exactly those who are selling the solution. 
Because just like any other aspect of diet culture, misery and shame ultimately just make you a better customer. When we are desperate for a solution, the simpler the solution, the better. So you have a problem, someone has a solution, and guess what? The solution is never to critically examine the superstructure of your entire life and existence and relationships and all of the ways that you're afraid to show fully up to that life in those relationships. No, 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 no. We're gonna give you a pill, we're gonna give you a shot, we're gonna send you in for some surgery, or in the case of the plant-based world, we're gonna tell you that all you need to do is to eat different food, eat the right food, eat the right food, and then you'll be right, you'll be good, you'll be absolved of all of your sins, fixed completely. It's obviously very enticing. And like any diet, it works short term. And that might be the biggest problem of all because that's what keeps us in the delusion. That's what keeps us convinced that our shame can be measured in calories consumed. If we could just get that number right and keep it right, we would be okay. And just like my lecture a few years ago, and I'll, I'll post a link to a video that I made with that script below, I can already hear this being completely misinterpreted. Jen says what you eat doesn't matter. Jen made another moderation video. Please don't misunderstand me. That is not what I'm saying. It is very important to eat well. It is very important to maintain a healthy weight. And a whole food plant-based diet is by far the best and most compassionate way I know to do both of those things. But for many of us, it's simply not enough to just eat the right food. If compulsive eating is your primary tool for managing an unmanageable life, and especially if it's been that way since you were nine or 10 years old, it's never going to be enough to just eat the right food. We have to go deeper with this stuff, or we will be on the same hamster wheel forever, enriching the diet industry, even as we deny ourselves basic permission to even exist. I have a lot of friends and colleagues who disagree with me on this, I am well aware. But almost without exception, they haven't lived it. They haven't felt the relief that comes with true compulsive overeating. They haven't experienced the intolerable somatic feedback in an unsafe interpersonal situation that is only escapable by altering one's physical state pretty dramatically. If your body is telling you to get out of a situation, it's telling you it's intolerable to be here right now, and you can't get out for whatever reason, the best and easiest option is simply to drown out those signals, overpower them with intense binging or intense restriction or both. It's easy enough that I figured it out by age 10, and so did a lot of people. That wasn't the pleasure trap. That was a sanctuary from an overwhelming, intrusive, judgmental, oppressive, conditional, transactional attachment matrix. When you're 10 years old and you don't have anywhere else to go and you can't even make sense of why it feels like you need to escape at all, suddenly irrational or even self-sabotaging behavior, like eating an entire loaf of bread, starts to feel like the only freedom we can find. And as soon as someone then sells us restriction as a solution, a solution to that out of control binging feeling that now we have, and that solution of restriction gives us a temporary feeling of okayness or even superiority, then we're hooked for life. Then it's once more into the binge restrict breach. Again and again and again and again and again until we are dead. There has to be a better way. And the plant-based world has, I think, a unique obligation and a unique opportunity to distinguish itself from the predatory dregs of the rest of diet culture and to engage with that question more holistically and compassionately. But part of the problem is that untangling these things is very complex and individual, and it doesn't lend itself to the pithy sound bites that make a brand. And as I've discovered, it actually is more likely to just get misinterpreted into the wrong pithy soundbite, her moderation talk, no matter how precise one tries to be. But that is no reason not to set the example as a movement and to have the conversation, or to at least try to have the conversation.
But that conversation, if it's going to be meaningful and if it's really going to make a difference to people, it also requires more of us who have actually been in it. Those of us who have lived our whole lives in this stuff to beat back that overwhelming instinct to hide in our shame and to tell our stories. And to do that even if we aren't perfect. To do that even if we've gained weight and are under self-imposed forever house arrest. I have gone years without creating or posting anything because I've gained 10 or 15 pounds. And I've talked to many women who can say exactly the same thing. I'm not going to do that anymore. And I really hope other women can make that commitment as well. Because if compulsive eating comes from this desire to escape being seen or judged in a way that feels unsafe, as it very often has for me, and I think that's a very common phenomenon for others as well, then healing from it is not going to come in the form of doubling down on that same instinct not to be seen or judged. Withdrawal and isolation are the symptoms, they're not the medicine. The medicine comes in allowing ourselves to be seen and judged and to stay present with ourselves anyway, even when it feels incredibly, horrendously uncomfortable. We have to learn to actually trust ourselves and our bodies and trust staying present in them throughout that process. And for many of us, that means learning to trust ourselves and our bodies for the first time. It is not going to happen overnight, but I believe it can happen if we can find ways to more effectively support ourselves and each other in doing that work. So that's it for this week. If you'd like to connect, I have virtual groups on my website on food stuff like this and other topics as well, and a variety of other resources. Until next week, don't abandon yourself, or at least don't abandon yourself quite as often. That's all I'm trying to do.